We're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. I'm Luna Goldberg, the Education Manager at the Jewish Museum of Florida FIU. On behalf of Hillel at FIU, the Jewish Museum of Florida FIU, the yeah. and the Holocaust and Genocide Studies Program at FIU, it is my pleasure to welcome you to FIU's annual Holocaust and Genocide Awareness Week. Every year, we organize and present a diverse series of events during this week to educate the community sound. and inspire thought, action, and greater civic engagement. Now, more than ever, this awareness is starting. Tonight's event, a continuation of the Black Lives in a Jewish Context Monday evening series, is a panel discussion about the movie Fig Tree co-sponsored by the Miami Jewish Film Festival, the Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs, and the Global Jewish Studies Program. It features a conversation with Dr. Tudor Parfit and Dr. Jonas Mulat, moderated by the Executive Director of the Jewish Museum of Florida FIU, Susan Gladstone Pasternak. Throughout today's conversation, Members of the audience are encouraged to post questions in the chat box that the moderator will pose to our panelists. Without further ado, please welcome Susan Gladstone Pasternak. Thank you so much, Luna. And thank you to all of you who have joined us for this very, very interesting evening. Uh, the first evening of Holocaust and Genocide Awareness Week and a continuing part, as Luna mentioned, of Black Lives in a Jewish Context, curated by Dr. Parfit, who I'll be introducing in just a moment. Uh, our first guest this evening is Jonas Mulat, who was born in Ethiopia in Addis Ababa, where he studied pre prior to coming to the United States in 2011 to FIU, where he received both a master's degree and a PhD in politics and international relations. And uh, he has also taught uh, in at the University of Liberia and at the Defense, Defense Command Staff College in Ethiopia. And we're very pleased to have his perspective this evening. Also joining us is Dr. Tudor Parfit. Dr. Parfit is a distinguished professor of the university at FIU, where he has come to us from a long career in England at Oxford and in Toronto and various other institutions around the world. He is the uh, director of the Global Jewish Studies Program at FIU. And we're very proud to say the academic director of the Jewish Museum of Florida at FIU. He has published over 30 books, the most recent of which is Hybrid Hate, Conflations of Antisemitism and Anti-Black Racism from the Renaissance to the Third Reich, which you can find a link uh, available to this wonderful book on our website. And he is also the author of one of the first, if not the first, he'll correct me if I am wrong, that it's not the first book, about Operation Moses, the untold story of the secret exodus of the Ethiopian Jews in 1985. So I'm gonna start our conversation about the movie with the assumption that all of you who are joining us tonight have viewed the film. And unlike the statement made by the late um, Larry King, I also watched the film so that I could participate in this conversation. Now the film, from my perspective, uh, watching it as a film, is a coming of age film. We watch a young couple go from screaming with glee and delight while playing at their beautiful fig tree in the beginning of the film to screaming in horror and despair at the end of the film when the realities of the world around them and what's happening has sunk in. That's a classic coming of age story that we've seen in many different contextual uh, parts of the world, periods of time, um, it, it, et cetera. So that concept, if we were only discussing it as a film, might be the focus. 
But this story of coming of age is taking place in a very, very specific place in a very, very specific period of time. And I think it's important for all of us to understand the context in which we are watching this piece unfold. So I turn to you first, Dr. Parfit. Could you please explain to us the historical context of the world in which this film lives? Yes, um, thank you indeed for that, um, for that lovely introduction, um, Susan. It's a great pleasure to be here tonight and to be talking on this um, uh, very interesting theme, uh, essentially around the, uh, the rather wonderful um, uh, film, Fig Tree, um, but also upon what the, uh, the film tells us deliberately or, or not um, about um, the history of the Ethiopian Jews and um, how it, uh, comes about that the entire community, uh, with a few exceptions, is now to be found in the Jewish state in, uh, in Israel. So I'm going to have to say a few um, uh, sort of personal words in a way here, because it just so, so happened that um, uh, as the operation that started to take the Ethiopian Jews to Israel in 1984, which was called the Operation Moses. As this uh, operation was starting, uh, not knowing that it was starting, I found myself um, in 1984, in November, uh, on the border between uh, Ethiopia and Sudan, where there was a, a string of um, refugee camps um, on the Sudanese side of the border, which had been taking in um, refugees from Ethiopia, uh, people who were fleeing the, uh, the civil war, which um, essentially had started in 1974 after the, uh, after the deposing of the, uh, of the emperor of Ethiopia, Haile Selassie. And also as a result of the uh, terrible, uh, shattering um, famine, uh, which um, wrecked havoc in Ethiopia between uh, 1984 and 1985. So when I got there, uh, the famine was entirely at its height. These are very rare photographs. Um, because there were no um, there were no journalists there. I don't believe any journalists ever went back to look at the um, the place from which the Ethiopian Jews had come. And this uh, is not a very wonderful photograph, but it's um, it's describing uh, Umra Kubra. It's the uh, it's the entrance to this camp. So one of the most um, poignant moments. Um, uh, during my uh, uh, visit, I, I should just say I was there on behalf of the minority rights group because the um, rumor had got to London that um, uh, Jewish refugees, the Falasha or the Bet Israel, um, uh, we don't use the term Falasha anymore, but it was used widely at the time. Um, were being poisoned by the Christian refugees in the uh, in the uh, in the in the camps, and that genocide, in fact, was uh, was taking place. And one of the very first things that I saw when I got to 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 the to the place where the, they were allegedly being um, poisoned was a, a vast area which was um, described to me as being the, uh, the graveyard of the Jews. It was a separate um, area from other uh, facilities for Christians. And um, nobody knows how many uh, uh, Jews died there on the way to, to Israel, but probably it ran into thousands. So one of the first things that I see, I, I don't know at all what's going on. Um, you know, it's a, uh, it's a very, uh, very curious uh, position to be in. I'd had a kind of hint 
two or three nights before I left uh, England uh, to go to uh, the Sudan. And that was, um, I was invited to a dinner party and um, just so happened that the then um, uh, Israeli ambassador was at this dinner party. And we were chatting and I told him I was going to uh, do a, a, a report for the minority rights group um, in Ethiopia. And he said, you mustn't go, I forbid you to go. And um, well, I didn't see that it was his job to forgive, forbid me to do anything. And uh, so he didn't, he wasn't any more specific than that. And no doubt he wasn't allowed to be any more specific than that. And so I uh, proceeded. And so one of the first things I see is that um, these, uh, these Ethiopian Jews are being uh, loaded onto um, trucks and going away. Uh, but I had no idea, uh, you know, why this was, wh why people were going from Umrakuba, where they were going, nobody was saying anything at all to me. And so this is one of the, um, one of the Ethiopian um, Jewish uh, girls who um, had uh, just arrived when I, when I got there. She was in, a, as you can see, a, a t terribly um, emaciated um, state. And through an interpreter, she told me some of the harrowing uh, um, things that she'd been through. She had been raped and um, the, the road going up to where the majority of the Jewish uh, settlement was, which is on the other side of um, Lake Tana, round about Gondar, and this is where they came from. Um, it's a long way and they were on the road um, walking uh, through these wild areas um, uh, for, for months. And um, she had in the camp just given birth to this uh, baby and the baby uh, unfortunately tragically died um, while, uh, while I was there. Um, the refugees in the camp, it was run by the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, UNHCR. And um, it was the most appallingly run camp you can imagine. And uh, subsequent to all of this uh, taking place, I went to Geneva and complained bitterly at the head headquarters of the ineptitude of the uh, of the UNHCR in respect to the uh, Jewish refugees, not least because um, they systematically uh, fed the refugees things that they simply would not eat. And so for the, mo for the most part, um, uh, the men anyway would sit around and um, drink coffee all day long and um, they could get coffee and they would prepared to drink that, but the food that, the, that, that they were given by the UNHCR was not deemed to be uh, kosher, using the term that they, they used. And um, indeed, it, um, it was made with uh, different sorts of oils that uh, clearly were not uh, suitable for, for a Jewish, uh, for a Jewish um, group. So this is another um, emaciated uh, refugee and children. So, I mean, I think this is really quite a good introduction to the film in the sense that um, these photographs were taken in 1974. Uh, the Operation Moses started in 1974 and carried on until such time as a uh, West Bank journal by the name of Nukuda uh, revealed the story um, and it was picked up immediately by the by the world press. It was a front page story throughout the world. And at that point, the the fact that Israel was cooperating with um, with uh, the Sudan, an Arab League uh, country, uh, just created a, an impossible uh, circumstance for, for the Sudanese uh, leadership as well as uh, for the state of Israel. And so it came to a halt. And subsequent to that, it, um, and this is what we're going to be seeing in the film, it was pretty haphazard for the next, uh, for the next few years until the end of the um, uh, Marxist uh, 
uh, regime which came to power in, uh, in 1974 and with various name changes persisted until uh, really the end of uh, Russian um, influence in the area. Um, uh, around about 1989, uh, 1988, 1989. Which is uh, the time frame of the film. So I didn't realize that it was towards the end um, of the of the regime. Um, I'd like to um, to ask uh, Jonas a question. And I'm going to return to you, Dr. Parfit, and I've had a request um, from the audience if you could speak up a little or a little more closely to the microphone. Thank you. Um, you um, are, are much uh, younger than the people in the film, Jonas. What, growing up in Ethiopia, if anything, were you taught about this period of the history of your country? Uh... Thank you, Susan. And again, thank you for giving me this opportunity to take part uh, in this discussion. And um, I'm glad I joined this discussion because I really enjoyed watching this film. And, uh, you know, what I find striking is for one, it's about Ethiopia and it's about the country where I was born and where I grew up. But in addition to that, as you said, as you mentioned, it was made uh, you know, in, in 1989, so the time period is 1989, and that is actually my time of, you know, coming of age. And in 1989, I was making that transition from uh, elementary school to high school. So it was a time of coming of age for me too. So the same uh, situation that uh, the adolescents were going in the movie was, it was the same thing that I was going through at the time. So it was, uh, you know, it, it was a, you know, it took me back to what the situation was back then. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, all the, the, the fact that the civil war was going on and it was encroaching on the capital at Addis Ababa, this is 1989. It's two years before, uh, before the end of the regime in 1991. And we could sense it and, you know, the presence of, uh, the military in the streets and conscripting uh, the youth, including us, the way that in the movie individuals and the youth were ducking uh, and trying to avoid uh, the soldiers. You know, it was the same thing that I was going through. And that is something that I found that I could relate to from mm -hmm. the movie, definitely. And yeah, and in addition to that, of course, you know, Unfortunately, the cycle of violence in that area still continues and Ethiopia has been in the news very recently because of some issues as well. So that is, you know, all the context that has been going on mm. uh, when I watched the movie. Uh, Dr. Parfit, I'm gonna ask you another question um, that uh, relates to something that Yona said, which is in the film, all the young men are hiding. Uh, Ellie is not Jewish, he's uh, very close Mina, but he is not actually Jewish. He's hiding. It's not particularly uh, Jews that are being conscripted into the army, uh, as we might have seen in, in Russia at the turn of the century, where Jews were fleeing because they were being conscripted. All young men were being conscripted. So what in particular were uh, the discriminatory elements of life for Jews in Ethiopia during this time frame? Could you tell us a bit about that? Well, I think that the, you know, the, the period I know a little bit about, which is the the period 1984 through to, you know, the, the end of the 80s, um, they, Jews were being discriminated against in certain respects because they tended to do pretty badly out of the, um, the land reforms. That was one of the, area, one of the areas in which you could see discrimination. So, um, you know, local uh, administrators would be responsible for the, uh, for the provision of land um, under these reforms and the Ethiopian Jews tended to get um, uh, poor land. Well, they maybe didn't have any land before, but still they didn't do very well out of the uh, uh, redistribution of land. That was one thing. The other thing was the kind of superstitions that attached to them. And you saw this a couple of times in the film where they're referred to as um, uh, Buddha, 
uh, which um, means uh, something like a witch or a, you know some kind of supernatural uh, thing. And um, you know there were the, the ideas that um, uh, the Ethiopian Jews could turn into hyenas, all sorts of uh, very uh, negative uh, superstitions about them. So that was a uh, that was the second thing, in a way. The, um, of course, the, their practice of Judaism was, was banned. But at the same time, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the Marxist government was anti-all religion, so they weren't particularly singled out. But, you know, they were in the middle. Um, they kind of were in the middle of, um, of the civil war. And um, both sides had no particular sympathy or interest in, in them. Um, and of course, in the famine, um, who were their friends? Really, they were one of the most, um, not the only, I mean, there were plenty of minorities in Ethiopia that were um, discriminated against and uh, were poor and uh, persecuted. And the uh, Falasha, the, the Bet Israel, they, they, they were one of them. Um, but the people um, I saw were utterly desperate people, desperate to get out of the country and um, desperate to get um, to Jerusalem. And so um, would it be possible for me just to go back to one of my slides? Sure. Um, So let me see if I can find. So if we look at this slide here, this was the kind of formal entrance uh, to this uh, camp, uh, Umra Kuba. And I saw um, a string of incredibly emaciated uh, utterly impoverished uh, people uh, arrive at this um, at this uh, gate and maybe the gate was the first kind of construction they'd seen for a while but anyway they imagined there was a kind of blockhouse a little bit I don't have a photograph of it but just a little bit further up there was a slightly more substantial building and seeing it they thought they got to the end of their journey and um, and so they, uh, they, they thought that this was Jerusalem. They kind of fell on the ground and they started kissing the earth. Mm -hmm. They thought that they had um, arrived uh, at their uh, final destination. So let me get out of that if I can do that. Okay, maybe you can do that um, within that. Take me out of the thing. There we are. Um, so, I mean, one of the things, having seen the film and sort of comparing it with my memories, the people I saw, and I, I crossed into Ethiopia briefly and went uh, up the track that they were coming down. And they told me stories of how they were being fired on at night and planes and shifter bandits, and it was horrendous. And I mean, the people in the film, of course, this was in Addis Ababa. They looked um, pretty well fed, and there was a lot of food um, happening in, in the film. There was no shortage of food. Um, and um, people were relatively uh, uh, well dressed and um, prosperous looking. And I mean, I'm not sure, but in the few years um, following the, the famine, that really would have been the case. It would be interesting to. Uh, to see what Jonas has to say about that. Mm -hmm. Yes, Dr. Mulat, because the the um, director of the film was living in Ethiopia. This is to some extent her story, although she was a little bit younger. So this might have been what she saw. Uh, and I believe Dr. Du Dr. Parfit's right that you know we see people eating. There's quite a lot of imagery about water constantly throughout the film, which we can discuss at another point, but certainly no lack thereof, maybe not the cleanest, but it's there constantly. Uh, is, is that an accurate, in your opinion, accurate of what life was like in 1989? 
I would say in 1989, life would be like that. And uh, the location of uh, the place uh, is, uh, you know, fig tree in, in Amharic means uh, Shola. And uh, so there is some one locality inside Addis Ababa, which is called Shola. And it's very close to the Israeli embassy actually. And quite uh, uh, several, uh, Beta Israel people used to settle there to be close to the embassy of Israel. Of course, Israel didn't have an embassy back then because there was no diplomatic relation. It was discontinued. And, uh, and also to go back to the uh, film, to the movie, uh, the, the, the grandmother, she was a weaver and she was quite good at it. And she used to make some money by selling that to, there was one person actually who was, you know, buying uh, what she was making and he was you know who was com uh, complimenting her on the quality of her work so it was possible to make some money on the side and to use that for you know like basic amenities such as food and in in the capital things would be really much better although you know with the encroachment and the expansion of the war you know, I mean, things were rationed and the local administration, the Kabbalists uh, were using that as a means of control of the local population. But I would say it was uh, an accurate depiction of the time, mm -hmm. definitely. I was very struck, you know, the movie starts with her out in the forest, you know, chopping down firewood. I'm expecting her to go back to something, you know, uh, much more primitive than a concrete house with the telephone. Um, it, I'm not sure if that was a statement. What do you think, Dr. Perford? Is that, it, you know, there was a, 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 a huge contrast between the way people were living, sort of one foot in each I mean, the, type of life. I think the truth of the matter is that the, um, the vast majority of the, um, of the uh, Ethiopian Jewish population uh, lived in uh, smallish uh, villages in the um, in different parts of the country. It's true, um, but mainly uh, quite a long way from Addis Ababa, and particularly mm -hmm. the Tana up in the Simeon Mountains. That was where they were, and certainly the kind of interiors that we saw in the film had nothing at all to do with the uh, the the lives of the Ethiopian uh, Jews as I perceived them on subsequent mm. uh, journeys to uh, Ethiopia in later years. So very few um, sort of went uh, to Addis and settled. I mean, I almost know who they were. Uh, they're that kind of rare. And so I guess this, I mean, that's not impossible at all. This, this individual, the grandmother, obviously was uh, settled. She knew people in the area. She'd got a, a settled business and um, she appeared to have good relations with the, with the neighbors as well. Um, but I think this was, uh, this was highly uh, unusual and it sort of comes out in one of the uh, dialogues uh, between uh, the grandmother and, um, and the girl and the uh, sort of estate agent person that was setting everything up for them. And she said, you don't want to behave like, um, you know, yeah. country <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. And um, I'm not obviously sure what the Ethiopian term is and whether it could best be translated by, uh, you know, bumpkins. But there was the idea mm. that you know, these people from the country, they, you know, they had to get sophisticated. And that's the reason that, I mean, the one kind of flash of humor in the film, and I thought it was a, a beautiful uh, part of the film, it was really rather funny, was the bit where they were practicing the uh, mm -hmm. project of getting past um, um, passport control. Mm -hmm. And the little vignette really was, uh, was, uh, was charming and uh, a, a beautiful part of the film, I think. Mm -hmm. um... I um, I think it was apparent, and I thought it was interesting because it was a communist regime, as you told us, Dr. Mulat at the time, and also that there was quite a um, a differentiation in financial. You know, there were wealthy people and less wealthy people. There were bigger bribes and smaller bribes. Um, 
there were you know, people who had an easier time getting out than others. Um, that struck me because it wasn't something I expected and, you know, with the little bit that I knew about the country at the time. Can you address that, Dr. Malat? Uh, yes, there was one instance where uh, Mina had to deliver some of the clothes that were made by her grandma and she was going to a, an apparently wealthy family and there was that juxtaposition of the two like uh, contrasts in the way of life definitely and it's 1989 mm -hmm. this is a 15 years after the Ethiopian revolution which was in 1974 and you know ostensibly it was a communist regime and the main idea was, of course, to get rid of private property and to make sure that people are economically more or less equal. But as you can see, you know, there was a great disparity of wealth in, the, in, in society. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the major industries were, of course, controlled and owned by the government, but there were local, I mean, low uh, scale businesses uh, mm -hmm. that were still controlled by individual businesses. In fact, because major distributions and production was controlled by the state, you know, only select few who had access to the state, who could bribe the state officials and, uh, you know, who had that privileged access to the state resources could enrich themselves. And it was a consequence of the revolution, unintended or intended, mm -hmm. it, uh, it doesn't matter, but definitely there was that wealth disparity in society. And it was also a source of grievance among uh, the population. In fact, you have seen the forced conscription of the youth. And if mm -hmm. you had money and if you had the connection, you could actually bribe the, uh, the officials and the, even the military officials and make sure that your uh, sons and daughters actually uh, evaded that conscri uh, conscription. Mm -hmm. Even in that, even in the conduct of war, the, uh, you know, the disparity in wealth mm -hmm. was, was evident. Right. Because that, that seemed to be a, a huge motivator in the film. We know that Ellie is not Jewish, but nonetheless, the motivation to get him out of being conscripted, which, which happens in the end, is, you know, throughout the film. Um, and um, there's, I, I just want to address the film itself a little bit. I felt that the film used a lot of wonderful imagery and music uh, to sort of, you know, build us up to what became this, this ending. Uh, Dr. Parfit, would you like to talk about any of that? I'm just going to mention a couple things that I noticed. Um, and maybe also, um, Dr. Mulat, you could comment on them. I, first of all, I mentioned already the imagery of water. Of course, there's the fig tree and, and all the various things that that represents. But I also noticed that in almost every scene, there was some kind of flash of bright yellow. And I'm not sure if that meant anything. So Dr. Parfit, you start. Excuse me, Susan, could you, um, Dr. Parfit, could you try to speak up just a little bit? It's a little hard to hear you. Some people have mentioned, so just a little louder. Get a little closer to the computer. Thank you. Sorry for the interruption. I think I'll pass on the yellow. I okay, know. I just noticed it could be nothing. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't really speak to me. Maybe Jonas has got something to say about that. I mean, I, just before we kind of talk about the various things that I did think of, um, I think that the, um, the fact that um, Ellie is Christian and she is, um, is, uh, is Jewish um, is not nearly as unusual as it might be in other societies. And we have to remember that um, uh, a large proportion of the uh, of the community of um, uh, Falasha, let's call them that, because that's after all what they were called, um, were actually Christian, and so uh, Judaism and Christianity, in many respects, were closely uh, interwoven, and the uh, the name of the uh, of the community of Christians was was Faras Mora. Many of the Faras Mora. Um, if not all of the Faris more have finished up uh, in Israel. So it's not clear whether Eli is one of those or whether he's uh, of a more kind of uh, orthodox branch. I don't mean orthodox in mm -hmm. the Christian sense, but regular of the, uh, of the community or not, it's, uh, it's not um, said. But 
uh, at the same time, even certain of the things, I mean, yeah, it'd be interesting to know what Jonas thinks about this. Um, you know, the, it was translated in the, uh, you know, in the, in the subtitles with the, you know, with the um, people doing the, um, um, the census. Mm -hmm. And I uh, said, so you have 30 Jews living here. I'm not really sure how, you know, likely that sort of statement is. I, I suppose it's probably about right, but whether it would have been in 1989 in Addis, uh, I'm, not, I'm not so sure. I really don't know. Uh, it, it, there are people who've done work on the period and who know better than I do, but it, it struck me as being slightly full. I think that the, the film was much more about the, um, the war, um, the, 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 the civil war and conscription and danger than it was about the famine. The famine isn't really kind of there. And in the same way that the the funniest bit of the film was the um, was the piece of um, cinema um, in front of the uh, passport desk. Uh, the most um, striking bit of the film was obviously, uh, obviously in, in my uh, opinion, um, the uh, the the hanging of the uh, mm. the suicide attempt uh, at the base of the tree. And so I suppose that, um, you know, we have a legless person and we have a, a person without an arm. Well, there are all sorts of things that one could say about, um, you know, the meaning of legglessness, um, uh, an incapacity of being able to move on, being stuck in a situation, a hopeless situation. And similarly with the, uh, with the armless boy uh, who wants his um, uh, arm, which isn't there, to be massaged. Again, it's okay. a striking, uh, it's a very, very striking image. And um, so both of these things, it would seem to me, uh, are kind of uh, suggesting that you have a crippled society. And the word cripple comes up again, and the, um, if you just say it's rather randomly, uh, Mina, she, uh, she says, oh, you cripple. And the person that she's referring to at that point actually isn't a cripple. But very often um, in uh, certainly in literary texts, uh, the act of being crippled is highly significant of, uh, of wider issues. And one thinks of a, of a society that's been damaged uh, irrevocably by the, uh, by the terrible disaster that um, uh, befell uh, Ethiopia in 1974, which is not to say that I am a uh, royalist, but I am a royalist, as it happens, being English and being a, a staunch supporter of our great queen. And not to say that Haile Selassie was necessarily the, uh, the, the finest ruler that ever lived, but he, uh, certainly in African terms, he was an extremely uh, attentive uh, ruler in the situation that followed uh, um, uh, the uh, Haile Selassie regime was infinitely worse than anything that preceded it. So I think these are the main things I noticed. Uh, Dr. Mulat? Uh, yes, to comment on Dr. Parfit, uh, uh, what he noticed about the fact that it's not unusual to see a Beth Israel having, you know, a, a relationship with a Christian. That's true, definitely that is true. And, but there, one thing that I found that was unusual in the, in the traditional and conservative Ethiopian context was that Ellie was almost an adopted child of the house and he was almost her brother, we can say. And mm -hmm. that was really unusual to have uh, that type of relationship for her with someone who was basically a brother to her. And there was, I didn't notice like the grandmother when she knew that she had that type of relationship and love for him, the way that she accepted it. But right before that, the way that she was punishing her for you know going against the wishes of the family. I saw that contradiction in the person of the grandmother which was really well played by the actress. Mm -hmm. And 
And of course, she mentioned that she ran away from the countryside and she was a rebel herself. So there is that element of independence on her on her part, I guess. But mm -hmm. it was that was, I think, one uh, part of the movie which could really become a climax. Having that type of relationship between a brother and a sister would mm -hmm. have been. But again, uh, you know, the, the the main focus of the movie is mostly about the war that was going on at this mm -hmm. time and the extent to which it was really destructive on the day-to-day -day lives of normal people, ordinary mm -hmm. people in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. Definitely mm -hmm. that had an impact, you know, to the extent that he had to stay outside of the house and spend the, the day inside the jungle and on the tree and next to the river to avoid uh, being found out by the soldiers. Mm -hmm. It had that, mm -hmm. and, and again, as I said, I used to duck under you know, in a taxi when I saw police officers and thinking that I was going to be forcibly mm -hmm. uh, conscripted. So definitely that was one point. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, but with regards to the yellow, this was not something that I really noticed. Uh, yeah. And we can, we can pass that over. Because, I don't know, yellow is like, uh, you know, the color of the sunflower and it's something yeah. that comes right after the end of uh, the gloomy and wet weather mm -hmm. uh, uh, in Ethiopia. And it's considered to be a color of hope and a color of mm -hmm. youth. Maybe. Okay. Well, maybe that's why. Yes, th they wanted to emphasize and, and, that. Yes. And what about the fig tree itself? I mean, the fig tree, you know, their relationship starts out quite innocent and it's really not until after they find the uh, mm -hmm. soldier trying to kill himself that it switches from a place of innocence to a place of you know, reality yeah. and their relationship yeah. begins to change a bit. Yeah. But tell us about fig trees in Ethiopia. Uh, the fig tree, uh, one thing that I th think is, of course, the Shola and the, the locality in Ethiopia, uh, in Addis Ababa called the Shola. Uh, and that could be one. The other thing is, apparently, I think it grows really tall, the fig tree. And a person who is tall and handsome in Ethiopia is considered to be, you know, as tall and handsome as a fig tree and mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's also thought of as being a refuge maybe because of the size or the charisma that mm -hmm. person has and all the time that is the tree is the refuge for Ellie and also mm -hmm. for Mina to go there uh, to be child you know to be kids again and to play and to be playful mm -hmm. again and I think that was a main symbolism there. Right. And with regards to the uh, ex-soldier, ex-soldier, I'm assuming from mm -hmm. uh, and then who was trying to commit suicide. I think it, that's definitely a critique of the politics, security, and even society of the time. I I wish he had more lines in the movie. I wish he said more. It, there was only one line in that, but he did. He did say a lot, you know, in the thing that he was doing. Even at, you know, the final scene that was seen was he would be lying in the middle of the street, and people would be passing right, right by him, not even trying to help him. And I think that is definitely a critique of the Ethiopian society how mm -hmm. uh, how morality and ethics in society has degenerated, how it has become almost commonplace to see that because it was at the height mm -hmm. of the war and it was commonplace definitely. And uh, right. yeah, and you know, it's understandable that Ellie and all the other youths were trying to avoid conscription because, mm -hmm. you know, if you're, it, it was like a death sentence almost. They would be sent right to the war front with little or no training and, you know, just being a cannon for their for uh, for the war, so yeah, there's there's a lot of symbolism in this movie, definitely. Yes, I, I was struck by that scene as well when when people walk by because it's something we've seen in films of other tragic war scenes, uh, Schindler's List, for example, of things that happened, and that that brings me to another question about the concept of of refugees in general. One of the things that we talk about at the Jewish Museum of Florida FIU is that refugees from the world over and from different periods of time have similar experiences. Um, are there things, I know Dr. Parfit, you talked about the famine, which was very specific, but we're not seeing that at this time. But are there some universal themes of having to leave one home to go to another place? Um, 
that we see in this film that, that the actors are dealing with? Well, you know, it's, um, um, you know, I mean, what are the themes? The themes are uh, loss, essentially. Uh, if you go somewhere, you, you have to leave not only things that you're used to and mm -hmm. uh, smells and tastes that you're used to, um, mm -hmm. people that you love. And um, so this is clearly uh, present uh, in the film. The, uh, mm -hmm. the price that she's going to have to pay for a new life in Israel is the is the loss of the uh, you know the people mm -hmm. that um, she has grown to love, including Ellie. And it's one of the clearly, I mean, for um, Jews throughout the world um, over the last century and. Uh, um, not so much this, but the last century, certainly, migration was the major theme. So it plays, you know, well to um, to Jewish uh, sensibilities, I think. And, you know, one of the things that people very often um, say uh, is, why on earth didn't they leave before? Why did they leave it so late? For instance, in Hungary or Slovakia or Germany or wherever, mm. or indeed in um, many of the Arab countries um, around and about the uh, time of the War of Independence. And of course, it's incredibly difficult to leave a place. And I think that this comes through in the film. It really is difficult. It may be a kind of wonderful. Um, you know, shining um, city on the hill uh, kind of uh, thing that people are moving towards. But my goodness, it's very, very difficult to leave even the worst, uh, worst of all mm -hmm. possible places. So I think this yes. comes through. Yes. Um, I'm going to transition to some questions. Um, I, I do have one, just one question that Dr. Mulat, perhaps you could address that I noticed, which is that the grandmother who is identified as Jewish, has quite a number of tattoos. Um, could you explain that to us? Do you, did you recognize any of that symbolism? And uh, It's quite common for an older Ethiopian woman to have tattoos and uh, including mostly, of course, from the countryside, but I did not notice any specific type of tattoo that she had, but it's quite common to have a ta tattoo. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So here's a question from Dr. Steer, who's the director of our Holocaust and Genocide Awareness Week and program. Uh, he's asking if fig trees in the Middle East, at least, and perhaps in Ethiopia, symbolize longevity. Does this translate into this story in Ethiopia? Well, can I speak to this? Um, I think that I don't think that the fig tree that we see here is is actually um, a the fig tree that you know that we talk about in in the Middle East. Or mm -hmm. it's a different kind of tree. It doesn't have an edible fruit. Uh, I think birds eat, eat the rather hard fruit. Monkeys perhaps uh, eat it, but it's not it's not there for um, mm -hmm. for eating. And it's quite interesting, nonetheless, that, um, for instance, an Italian, if you want to compliment a man on being a beautiful man, um, I don't know about being a, you know, a, a, a tall man, but certainly a beautiful man, he's called Fico, you know, Fig. So, but I, I think that's an irrelevance, it's just probably a, a coincidence. The main thing of the, of the fig tree throughout the Middle East and um, southern parts of Europe um, it may very well be that in certain cases, as Dr. Steer suggests, it's got something to do with longevity, but it's essentially got to do with um, uh, procreation and, um, and fertility. It's a fertility, uh, both in ancient Greece and uh, mm -hmm. to this day in Italy, uh, barren women collect underneath um, uh, fig trees and, um, and uh, well, I... I could go on about fig trees. It's one of my interests, but I'll stop. Uh, well, you know, we do see them um, 
begin their life of as a you know consummate their relationship under the fig tree. But Joan Kasner has asked if the fig tree uh, is at all comparable to the pomegranate as a symbol of life. Well, uh, do you want me to say something about that? Sure. Okay, well, I mean, one of the great um, uh, issues, um, if you like, is um, what the fruit in the Garden of Eden was. And according to the rabbis, or at least certain rabbis, thought that this that it could easily be a pomegranate. And um, the pomegranate in all kinds of ways is, um, is uh, uh, reflected and celebrated in, in Jewish ritual simply because of its... Uh, it's a potential for massive um, uh, kind of rebirth. Um, uh, the fig as well, and you know, the, the fruit of the Garden of Eden was almost certainly a, a fig. And on the earliest representations that we have of the uh, story of Adam and Eve in the garden, uh, which go back to the first century, and to be found in Rome and in the catacombs, show it, uh, the, the fruit of the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve as being a, a fig. And there clearly was a, a sort of subterranean knowledge oh. of uh, this. Uh, and some rabbis similarly uh, thought that. But I don't think it's that kind of a fig. And I, I mean, I really am totally ignorant about the role of oh. this fig tree in, in mm -hmm. Europe. So this is very much, uh, very much on. Mm -hmm. oh. Right. So a few questions are coming up around that, that, um, uh, well, um, Adam and Eve covered themselves with fig leaves. Again, I suppose you're thinking this is from a different kind of fig tree. Um, why does Adam have an Adam's apple is a question. I'm not, is that li literally? Uh, um, I do have a question. I'm going to move on to a different topic for Dr. Mulat as we're running a short on time. And I have two more questions here. Um, was it commonplace during the Civil War for boys not to attend school? And if so, was it primarily to avoid conscription? Aaron Alman asked. Uh, OK, so to give now for a general context, so the Civil War that was in Eritrea, it was going on from 1961 to 1991. In the rest of Ethiopia, from 1975 to 1991. But it really intensified and came close to the capital Addis, starting from 1988 or 89. So the regime, when it was threatened, uh, when its power was threatened by the uh, by the rebel forces, it had to conscript. Uh, you know, soldiers, because, you know, like the soldiers were uh, surrendering to the rebel army in drones. So they needed that manpower, human power. So they started constricting uh, soldiers, mainly from the countryside, but later on also from the cities. Uh, and, uh, based on my knowledge of the time, you know, conscriptions in the schools, I never came across actually you know the police and the soldiers and the Kabale people coming to the uh, to the school and taking uh, uh, people from there. But the main threats, if I the way I remember, is the way back from school to home on the street. That was the main threat, and that was where the police would be waiting and the Kabale mm -hmm. people, the local administration, would be waiting. And later on, they came knocking uh, at the doors and they have a list of people. They have that list. And, you know, the government had that reach way down to the local level. And they know everyone that was living in the house. They know who was male and female. They know how old each individual was. So they had a list and they would come and force people out of their homes. That's what happened in the movie at the end as well. Uh, mm. And that did happen. Uh, so most of the time what we do is we'd go and spend some time in, you know, in a relative's house. So we'd go out, you know, out of the eyes of uh, the Kabali mm -hmm. people and just to hide. And, uh, but even then a lot of people were conscripted and they were taken to the, uh, to the France and many of them died, many of them mm -hmm. surrendered to the rebel army and came back as you know, victorious with the rebels in 1991 mm -hmm. as well. It, it backfired for the, for the regime 
you know, it, it, it lost the popularity, whatever popularity it had, especially the revolution, and it lost the war because of that. Uh, so, I mean, it's not a matter of skipping school. We used to go to mm-hmm. school, definitely, and they never trade on the fat school, but there were other ways, the way back from school to home or from home to school, and mm-hmm. also later on, even in homes. But again, people with means, with the connection and with the money, still manage to avoid and circumvent mm-hmm. uh, the state's uh, reach. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, I just have two more questions. Um, so one was, um, how did the Jews in Ethiopia prove that they were Jewish to be taken to Israel? Did they have to offer up some sort of proof, Dr. Parfit? Well, they certainly, um, uh, had to um, uh, prove it. Um, the film suggests that Ellie could have got away with it without very much difficulty. I don't know whether this was really true because the reason that um, people from the countryside were kept in the uh, compound uh, of the Israeli embassy for so long in many cases uh, was partly in any, in, in any case to um, allow them to um, make inquiries. And the, the people that, of whom they made inquiries were very often people uh, in Israel uh, who knew, I mean, everybody knew, knew who was what and how and where and so on. So the, they did it by word of mouth and interviews and, and so on. And they did try and ensure that um, the... Uh, you know, that um, the people leaving Ethiopia were indeed uh, of a, a better Israel background. That being said, there were lots of um, uh, Christians who had nothing at all to do with the, uh, uh, with the uh, Ethiopian Jews who actually made it to um, Israel and in many cases simply uh, were absorbed into the country while practicing mm-hmm. uh, Christianity and uh, joining the Ethiopian church in Israel, which is a very ancient date, part of the uh, mm-hmm. church of the Holy Sepulchre, who's got a, a very charming uh, Ethiopian Orthodox uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, chapel. Well, unfortunately, we're running out of time. I think the film brought up so much, both the uh, the way in which the film was made, you know, from a filmmaker perspective and the story the contextual story that it tells. I'm going to turn it over to Luna to sort of wrap up our our evening. I want to thank you both, uh, Dr. Parfit and Dr. Mulat, so much for participating in this program. Um, we've put some information in the chat about the remaining programs for the Holocaust and Genocide Awareness Week. And, um, and uh, please take a look there because there are a number of Uh, interesting programs coming for the rest of the week. So Luna, I'm gonna turn it to you to kind of wrap up. Thanks, Susan. And thank you to our speakers, Dr. Tudor Parfit and Dr. Jonas Moulet. Thanks again to today's co-sponsors, the Miami Jewish Film Festival, the Stephen Jay Green School of International and Public Affairs, and the Global Jewish Studies Program. If you enjoyed tonight's program, we have another film that's screening later this week. It'll be available on Wednesday. And if you go to the link that Nancy just dropped in the chat, you'll be able to register. And we invite everyone to join us tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. for the next event in the series. It's a discussion on the Instagram project at Eva Stories and will feature the co-creator Maya Kohavi. The registration details and information about our entire week's events can be found at the link. And thank you all for joining us once again. Thank you and good night. Look forward to seeing you soon in the museum in person when possible. Okay. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Parfit.